Good morning and welcome First Church family and friends. I am so glad to be gathering with you today wherever you are. And I'm excited that we have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you are, we believe that Jesus is here. And so just a couple of things. Uh, let me just remind you that you can visit us at our church website. The address is there on the screen, CherokeeFCC.com. You can go there and find out more about us as a church. Also, we encourage you to click on the links provided on whichever platform you're viewing the service today to fill out a, a digital connect card, uh, to give financially if you feel led to do that. And we also encourage you to, to connect by engaging in the online chat if you're viewing this morning through our church online platform. Just type the word hello there in the, in the chat box and let us know you're here. Also, feel free to submit a prayer request or to ask any questions that you might have. Again, I'm excited because this is going to be a great time together. In just a bit, we're going to be sharing the final message from our series, Our Journey with Jesus, a message entitled Remembering. You know, the Bible invites us to remember because memory is such an important vehicle for our spiritual identity and formation. And I believe that God has something to say to each one of us on this topic today. And so uh, sit back, Get ready to lean into what God has in store for us. It is going to be an amazing time, and I am so glad that you are here. Morning, fam. Let's stand up. We're playing some songs we're going to sing to Jesus this morning. So let's get to it. Let our shout be your name. 
you go ahead and take a seat. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. During this time of communion, we partake of the bread and of the juice, emblems of Jesus' body and his blood, just as Jesus instructed us. And Jesus also instructed us to remember him when we partake of these emblems. But exactly what ought we to remember about him? Should we remember his sin-free life? Or the parables that he taught? Uh, the miracles and the healings that he performed? Yes, we ought to remember all of those wonderful things about Jesus' life. But the most important thing to remember is actually stated in the very next verse, 1 Corinthians 11.26, which says, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Why should we remember and proclaim the Lord's death? The answer is provided for us in 1 Corinthians 6.20 that says, God bought you with a high price. As you take the communion emblems, remember that Jesus' body and Jesus' blood was the price that was required to pay for the debt of our sins. Look at the bread and remember that each one of us were responsible for nailing Jesus to that cross. Look at the juice and remember that our sins thrust that spear into his side. Communion is a time to remember how very sinful we are and that our sins cost Jesus his very life. But before you conclude that communion is a time for us to experience overwhelming guilt, remember that there is a wonderful upside to communion. We serve a God who loves us so very much that he was willing to pay this price that we might have a relationship with him. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, now welcomes us as his dear children. He no longer sees our sins. And if God has forgiven us, we must also forgive ourselves. We should never forget who we are and how far short we have fallen, but we must always remember that communion is a celebration of God's love for us. Life is a journey. It is filled with highs and lows, joy and sorrow. Along the way, we will face many obstacles that on our own we cannot overcome. So we need to travel well. We need to follow Christ so we don't stray from the path. His word has to be our compass 
always pointing us in the right direction. Because without Him, we are lost. In following His guidance, we have peace. And we experience His beauty and goodness. We find joy in His presence. And in following Him, we will never be led astray. In all your ways, submit to Him. And He will make your path straight. This morning, we're going to finish up our series of messages entitled, Our Journey with Jesus. Over the past couple of months, we've looked at several different spiritual disciplines, but not the usual sort of things that we, we normally think of when we think of spiritual disciplines. You know, things like prayer and Bible study and meditation, where we have to get away from everybody else and go find a quiet place. Now, we've been looking at things that we can do together things that we can do throughout the day in our, in our everyday lives. But everything that we've talked about has been with the express purpose of shaping our lives more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Because if we're moving in that direction, then nothing else we do really matters. Because we can come together and we can worship every week and we can spend hours every day studying the Bible. But if we aren't growing spiritually in such a way that we begin to talk more like Jesus, uh, live more like Jesus, love more like Jesus, then we are simply wasting our time. Uh, this morning, the last discipline that we're going to look at is the discipline of remembering. Uh, well, really, that's not exactly accurate. Uh, we're actually going to be looking at a couple of other disciplines that will help us to remember. But first, I want to talk about the importance of remembering because I'm not sure we really appreciate just how valuable our memory is. You know, there are a lot of passages in the Bible where God tells us that we need to remember. In Exodus chapter 13, for example, Moses said to the people of Israel, this is a day to remember forever. The day you left Egypt, the place of your slavery, today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. In Numbers 15, God told the Israelites to put tassels on their garments. And then he said to them, when you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, as the Israelites were about to cross over into the land of Canaan, Moses said, Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God, for he is the one who gives you the power to be successful. And then uh, also uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, we read, Remember the days of long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father and he will inform you. Inquire of your elders and they will tell you. And then in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 12 we read, Remember the wonders that he has performed, his miracles, and the rulings that he has given. And then when we get to the New Testament, the admonitions continue there. Uh, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said, Remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.8, Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news that I preach. And then in Revelation chapter 2, uh, Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, Remember the height 
from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And of course, we can't talk about the importance of, uh, of remembering in Scripture without mentioning what Jesus said when he instituted the Lord's Supper. It says he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so remembering is important. And, and our memory is a valuable thing. I don't know if any of you have ever lost your memory for a while. I'm not talking about forgetting where you left your car keys or, or forgetting what day your anniversary is. I'm talking about experiencing amnesia, losing your memory. When I was in college, we, we had uh, intramural basketball that was played between different teams made up of students who lived on campus. My first couple of years in college, I played on one of those intramural teams. And as often happens during games between a bunch of highly competitive guys, things get a little bit rough. Well, during one game, I went up to bring down a rebound, and while I was up in the air, my legs got taken out from under me, causing me to come crashing down to the court and, and hitting the back of my head pretty hard on the floor. Well, as a result of that, I ended up suffering a mild concussion. And when I got back to my dorm room a little bit later, I realized that I couldn't remember even the simplest things. I couldn't remember what I had done earlier that day. I couldn't, ha I couldn't remember what I'd done the day before. Now, fortunately, the amnesia only lasted a couple of hours, but, but during that time that I lost my memory, I felt pretty scared. You see, when someone completely loses their memory uh, through Alzheimer's or some form of dementia, everything that is familiar becomes foreign. And you begin to lose not only your memory, but in a sense, you begin to lose your identity. I mean, think about it this way. Who you are is the sum total of everything that you have experienced. Where you went to school, who your friends were, all the things that you've done. Uh, whether you prefer chocolate or vanilla ice cream, whether you prefer action movies or comedies, a spicy food or mild food, all of that is a part of your story. But the way you know what those preferences are is through your accumulated memory. And that is what defines you as a person. And what is true of individuals is also true of groups of people. It is possible for an entire society of people to experience cultural amnesia, to forget the past. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this quote from George Santayana. Uh, Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You've heard that before? Well, at least that's close to what he said. What he actually said was, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Remembering the past is important as we look to live in the future. Now, I'm not talking about living in the past, okay? There's a big difference between living in the past and remembering the past. You know, there are some people who just can't seem to get their minds off of the things that happened decades ago. And they're miserable because of it. Uh, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is remembering the past. Remembering the mistakes that we've made so that we don't make those same mistakes again. Uh, remembering why we do the things that we do. Remembering all of the things that make us who we are. You know, the truth is, all of our lives are shaped by the past. I am who I am because of the things that I've experienced over my lifetime. But to some degree, I'm also who I am because of the things that my parents did. 
And they were influenced by their parents. And so what my grandparents did influences who I am today, at least uh, to some degree. And the same thing is true of us as Christians. Our lives have been shaped by the things that we have done over the past year here at First Church. But going back even further, the way that each of us was raised in the church, or not raised in the church, if that may be the case, that's helped us to help to shape us into who we are today. And going even further back, uh, what Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone did way back in the 1800s has helped to shape who we are as a church today. And going back even further, what the Christians of the early centuries did has shaped who we are. Our collective past is part of what makes us who we are today. And one thing that I haven't always appreciated is that there is great value in looking back to learn about some of those uh, ancient influences in our lives. And just as surely as, as the DNA of our ancestors plays a role in our present existence, the things that happened to Christians in the past continue to play out in our lives today, whether we're aware of it or not. The writer of Hebrews makes mention of these saints from the past generations. Uh, he spends all of Hebrews chapter 11 showing the great faith of many of these men and women in the Old Testament. And then in chapter 12 he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such this huge crowd of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Uh, the Living Bible paraphrases that verse this way. Since we have such a huge crowd of men and women of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. And so the writer uses here the illustration of running a race to describe our Christian lives. And more specifically, he used a picture of the Grecian athletic games that were held in that day, which were very similar to our modern-day Olympics. You see, in the Grecian games, those who ran in these races were surrounded by people watching from the grandstands, cheering them on. So, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer says, in essence, that all of these heroes that I've listed here and all of the believers who have ever died are watching us from the grandstands in heaven as we run our spiritual race. We are all connected you know, time and again, the New Testament uses people from the Old Testament as examples for us. Because events from the past are not just for the sake of recording history. No, they are there to help us to make good decisions in our lives. As Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And, and what has been passed on to us, we take and we pass it on to others. And so the Bible calls us to remember because memory is such an important part of our spiritual identity and our spiritual formation. You know, without memory, we wouldn't be able to grow spiritually and mature as Christians. Without memory, we couldn't be thankful because gratitude assumes that we remember the gifts that, we re that we've received. Without memory, we would lose our identity because we can hardly know who we are or, or why we're here if we have no memory of where we've been. Without memory, we wouldn't even be able to repent because, you know, how can we be sorry if we don't remember our past sins? And finally, without memory, we wouldn't have any hope for the future. Uh, now, that may not seem to make sense, and so let me describe it this way. I have a hope of what my life will look like when I someday maybe retire. 
It's a hope that I'll be able to spend more time with my wife, Angela. Uh, do more things with Angela. Go more places with Angela. But that hope is built on past experiences. I have a hope for those things because I can remember the times in the past when we spent more time together and did things together and went places together. Those memories help to shape what my hope for the future is. And so if I could remember any of those past experiences with Angela, I wouldn't, you know, if I couldn't remember those, then I wouldn't have much hope for the future. And so I think that helps us to understand why it's such a scary thing to lose your memory. While amnesiacs have little hope for, have little to hope for, people with strong memories see possibilities. They know that their present condition is not the only option. Memory of God's faithfulness in the past is a source of confidence and courage when, when trial or disappointment comes our way. You see, people with good memories can, th can say, you know what, things can be different. I've seen it happen before. But again, it's important to understand that memory is not simply a private or individual thing. In fact, as ancient Israel and the, and the early church understood, memory is formed and sustained in faithful community. Uh, Walter Brueggemann has said that the church is the community that gathers to remember. Now, there are several things that we can do to keep from forgetting, not the least of which is studying Scripture. In fact, the Bible teaches, the, teaches us that we should not only remember, but that we should help others to remember. You could even go so far, I think, as to say that the Bible is a book of memories that are meant to be shared from one generation to the next. And it's not enough for just one person in the community to remember. The whole community needs to be devoted to passing this story of faith on to the next generation. And part of the way that we do that is by understanding that we are all part of a story, a story that's been going on for centuries. For example, the story of Exodus from the Exodus from Egypt was not just a shared was not just shared as a piece of history to be learned. Jewish boys and Jewish girls were taught to see themselves in that story. And when they recited the story of the Exodus, they always did so in the first person as their personal story. In the future, Deuteronomy 6 says, children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land that he had sworn to give our ancestors. And so God said to the Jews, when you tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt, don't talk about what happened to them. Talk about what happened to you. And as the Jews shared this story from generation to generation, the story became their own. What could have been just a, a stale textbook account became a personal story embedded in the hearts of each and every member of that community. And you know, something similar happens in our worship when we come together and we share the story of Christ's death and resurrection. When we take the Lord's Supper and we remember what Jesus did for us, what he did for me, it's our story and we remember it together. But I think it's important for us to, to share these stories not only here with each other, but also in our homes. 
It's important to notice that, that in the Old Testament, God didn't task the Jewish leaders with the responsibility of teaching the children about God. Uh, he, he, didn't tell, uh, he didn't tell the prophets or the priests to tell the story of God's goodness to the children. No, that was a job that he gave to the parents. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 says, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Re repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you are getting up. And so it's important that our children not only hear Bible stories from their Sunday school class teachers or youth group leaders, but that they hear them from their parents. As the song that we sometimes sing puts it, tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. And so parents, grandparents, share that story. And help your children or your grandchildren to understand that they are a part of that story. But there's something else that we can do to uh, continue to remember who we are and, and where we've come from. Uh, it, it, it's interesting uh, to me, uh, really, uh, that the people who live in less developed cultures often lack some of our modern conveniences. Uh, you, not only advanced technology like computers, but, but even things that we take for granted like books and libraries. And yet, strangely enough, those less advanced cultures are usually better at preserving and sharing their cultural memory than more advanced cultures are. Uh, traditional cultures understand why those stories are so important to their well-being, and they remember how to transmit them from generation to generation. And, and one of the uh, most uh, ancient and effective ways of, uh, of helping to remember is through what I would call a shared meal. A shared meal. It's significant how prominent meals are in the Bible. Have you ever thought of that? Uh, Abraham prepared a meal for three strangers who stopped by for a visit. Uh, we read of Moses who ate a meal with 70 elders on Mount Sinai. Boaz invited Ruth to join him for a meal. We got the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, of Jesus eating with Zacchaeus, Jesus often eating with other tax collectors and sinners, Jesus eating with Mary and Martha, Jesus eating with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus eating with Peter and the other apostles there by the Sea of Galilee. The early church breaking bread in each other's homes from day to day, we're told. The love feasts of the early church. And I think it's worth noting that at the very center of the spiritual lives of God's people in both the Old and the New Testaments, uh, at the very center we find a table. The table of Passover and the table of communion. N.T. Wright has said, when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. Eating is referred to in Scripture a lot. Jesus often used the meal as a symbol of spiritual harmony and union with God. In Luke uh, chapter 14, verse 15, he said, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. In uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. The truth is that, that among the early Christians, there was a, a mysterious blending of food and faith that we don't quite understand because we want to try to separate the sacred and the secular. 
Daryl Tippins in his book, Pilgrim Heart, says that he says, I remember as a young Bible reader trying to distinguish between uh, trying to distinguish between the mills mentioned so often in the New Testament. Which were the secular ones, he asked, and which ones were sacred? He said, I had to give up my flawed projection because in the Bible, food talk is really simply God talk. For the early Christians, a meal was not only a time uh, to, to share food, but it was a time to share prayers, scripture reading, the singing of hymns. While sharing a meal together, all of our senses are involved. Listening to the conversation and story, the aromas and flavors of the food and drink, the sights and smiles and gestures, the holding of hands and blessing. And so no wonder feasts were arranged when biblical characters wanted to celebrate some important occasion, such as when the father welcomed home his prodigal son. And we need to recognize the fact that meals shared together have the same power, uh, the same power today to, to stir our hearts and our memories just as they did uh, in, in ancient times. Uh, meals are, are an important part uh, of our story because eating is close re closely related to memory. Uh, enjoying your food is not only the taste of the food at the time, but it's also the memory of other times that you've enjoyed that very same food. Uh, the time that you spend physically enjoying your food is very short. What's left after that is the memory. I mean, if you ate something as a child and, and you didn't like it, chances are you don't want to eat it today either. On the other hand, you may go out of your way to purchase a specific food item because you've had it before and you want it again. You may travel a distance to dine at a certain restaurant because of the memory of the food that was served to you there uh, some time ago. I mean, just think back to, to your childhood. Uh, think of the very best times that you shared with your family. Uh, and I'm going to guess that there was a, was a table involved that had food on it. Maybe a Thanksgiving meal. Maybe Christmas. Maybe a family reunion in the summer. Uh, maybe a pig picking or a fish fry. And you can remember the smell of the kitchen because our brain remembers odors and smells and scents better than just about anything else. And if meals shared together are filled with such emotion and memory, then any community, whether that be a church or a family, that wants to be serious about the transmission of values will give special attention Two meals. I was reading this past week uh, an article by a gentleman by the name of Barry Jones. Uh, he was talking about how when he and his wife uh, got married, that they bought this small uh, pub table. But about 10 years later, they needed something bigger. But Barry says, we couldn't bring ourselves to get rid of it. He said, after countless meals together, often shared with family and friends, he said that table had become an icon of God's grace and goodness. He said, the people we love the most sat with us there. Meals were shared there. Stories were told. Sins were confessed. We laughed together and we cried together. Together we remembered where we'd been and where we dreamed of where we might one day go. He said, we prayed at that table and there we experienced God's nearness, God's kindness, and God's love. You know, it seems to me to be such a shame that most families today, sadly including my own, have gotten away from the practice of sitting around the table at dinner. And I think we've lost something as a result. 
The sharing of that meal together is an opportunity to do more than just eat. It's a time to remember, a time to tell the story of who we are and where we've come from, and, and to tell the story of God and the story of Jesus Christ. It's a time to create memories, memories that will shape who our children and our grandchildren become in the years ahead. And I believe that one of the most important spiritual disciplines for us to recover is the discipline of table fellowship. Uh, in our fast-paced, uh, you know, tech-saturated, uh, attention-deficit-disordered culture in which we find ourselves, we've lost something. Christians need to restore the art of a slow meal around a table with people that we really, truly care about. Table fellowship doesn't, doesn't usually make the list of the classical spiritual disciplines, however. But there is something very important about the way that, that sharing a meal together nourishes, uh, nourishes us both physically and spiritually. And so as we come to the end of this series, I hope that it's not just been a lot of talk, but that I've been able to, to help you to see some things that you can actually do in your everyday life that will help to shape you into the image of Jesus. And I hope that you've, made, that you've actually made an effort uh, to, to put some of these things into practice. Because in the end, just listening to me preach won't make you like Jesus. For that to happen, you're going to have to make some changes. And I hope that one of those changes is that you will spend more time remembering. Remembering what God has done for you. Remembering who you are and how you fit into God's great story. And not just remembering, but sharing that story, passing that story on to the next generation, helping your children, your grandchildren, helping others to remember as well. And finding more opportunities to do that, we find more opportunities to do that seated around a table than just about anywhere else.
24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. So lift your head, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. So we receive.